We've all heard about the mutiny on the bounty in Captain William Bly. It's an incredible story made famous through movies and books. However, it has created a perception about a man that many people don't really know much about. Today, most people think that he was simply a bad-tempered disciplinarian, but in fact, we find that he was a very lenient captain for his day. The true story is a story of an accomplished man who played a part in the founding years of British settlement here in Australia. His journey led him to travel across the world to remote places like the South Pacific Islands. He endured incredible hardships and circumstances where his faith was tested. In William Bly, we find a man that chose to put his dependence on the sovereignty of God. He was a man guided by faith in Jesus Christ. William Bly was born in England on September 9th, 1754. At the tender age of seven, he was sent to the Royal Navy as a ship's boy. It was common at that time to start children in a mariner's life early so that they could gain the necessary experience to be promoted more quickly. Ten years later, at the age of 17, Bly became a midshipman serving on several of the Royal Navy's ships. He grew up to be an intelligent man, well versed in science and mathematics, and was also a talented writer and illustrator. Five years later, in 1777, he was appointed sailing master on Captain James Cook's boat, the Resolution. It was on this voyage that he would find himself at the other end of the world at Adventure Bay on Bruny Island. This is Adventure Bay on Bruny Island in southern Tasmania. And it's really famous because here Captain Cook arrived in 1777. On board the Resolution was William Bly. He was the sailing master at the age of 22 years of age. And he was to come back as the commander of the boat, the Bounty, in 1788, that's 11 years later, in August, September, where he spent 12 days here and where they did repairs. Fletcher Christian did them up there just a few hundred metres away. Four of the 11 years between those two visits to Adventure Bay were spent continuing the journey with Captain Cook. Cook's life was ended by natives in the islands of Hawaii during that voyage. After Bly's four years of sailing, he would return to England and marry Elizabeth Betham the following year, and a few days later he was appointed as a ship's master. Within a short period, Bly was again promoted, this time to lieutenant. The end of this 11-year period would see Bly, at the age of 33, given the command of the bounty with a commission to transport breadfruit from Tahiti to the West Indies. His route would take him around the Cape of Africa through to Tasmania, where he stopped at Adventure Bay, the place he had visited 11 years earlier. The ship was brought up into a river for repairs by master's mate Fletcher Christian, and during this time Bly planted various fruit trees in the area for the local indigenous people. From Bly's writing we read these extracts. In August 1787 I was appointed to command the Bounty, a ship of 215 tonnes burthen carrying four six-pounders, four swivels and 46 men, including myself and every person on board. We sailed from England in December 1787. We left with every favourable appearance of completing the object of the voyage. The story of Bly's journey continues from Adventure Bay all the way to Tahiti. The ship on its initial part of the voyage had suffered great delays due to bad weather. So by the time they arrived in Tahiti, the men had to wait five months for the breadfruit to sufficiently ripen. Tropical paradise and months of waiting in the company of beautiful half-naked women Many of the men fell in love with the local women and didn't want to leave. So upon leaving Tahiti, thoughts of mutiny with the crew were very strong. Fletcher Christian and his co-mutineers had a lot of women and they lusted for them so much that they decided to have a mutiny and finally found Pitcairn Island, which they had noticed previously on maps and so on. And Fletcher Christian and his men really had such murderous and lustful thoughts, even with the indigenous men there on the island that they took with them, with their wives, that uh, they fought and killed each other until two remained, that is, two men, Adams and Young. And after a while they decided this is not the way to live. So they decided to reintroduce the Christian faith. They, they had prayers, they had uh, grace before and after meals, they had Sunday services, they began worship and really they decided to have a little Christian nation. 
The small island of Pitcairn, a small dot in the vast expanse of ocean, was a perfect location for the mutineers to hide. Once the mutineers had murdered each other, the new beginning started with Thou shalt not murder, and the Ten Commandments, which were carved out of wood from the original bounty, were taught to the island's women and 19 children that were left. These Ten Commandments are now on display on Norfolk Island. After the mutiny, Fletcher Christian, as one of the main mutineers, set Bly adrift in the middle of the open ocean, on a launch with his loyal crewmen. William Bly set off with his 18 crew, one had been killed called Norton, and uh, as he saw, sailed in this boat, open boat with two sails, it was 23 feet long and 6 foot 9 wide, uh, with these people on board, he prayed and believed in providence, and it was providence that saved him, and he acknowledged that. And certainly when he arrived in Australia, going through from Tonga, through to the Fijian Islands, and through the northern Vanuatu near the Banks Group, he, he went up to the, the highest points of uh, Australia, and as he arrived there and set forth for Timor, he realised that he needed to pray more and understand God's working uh, in saving them. And he said a prayer that was beautiful on embarking to East Timor. Bly wrote in his prayer book the following. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, in and through the merits of our blessed Saviour, through whom we are taught to ask all things. We, thy unworthy servants, prostrate ourselves before thee and humbly ask thee for forgiveness of our sins and transgressions. We most devoutly thank thee for our preservation and are truly conscious that only through thy divine mercy we have been saved. We supplicate thy glorious majesty to accept our unfeigned prayers and thanksgivings for thy gracious protection. Thou hast showed us wonders in the deep that we might see how powerful and gracious a God thou art, how able and ready to help those who trust in thee. Thou hast given us strength and fed us, and hast shown how both winds and seas obey thy command, that we may learn even from them to hereafter obey thy holy word, and to do as thou hast ordered. We bless and glorify thy name for this thy mercy in saving us from perishing, and we humbly beseech thee to make us as truly sensible of such thy almighty goodness, that we may be always ready to express a thankfulness not only by our words, but also by our lives in living more obedient to thy holy commandments. Continue, O Lord, we beseech thee, through the mediation of our blessed Saviour Jesus Christ, this thy goodness towards us, strengthen my mind and guide our steps. Grant unto us our health and strength to continue our voyage, and so bless our miserable morsel of bread, that it may be sufficient for our undertaking. O Almighty God, relieve us from our extreme distress, such as men never felt. Conduct us through thy mercy to a safe haven, and in the end restore us to our disconsolate families and friends. We promise, O Lord, with full and contrite hearts, never to forget thy great mercies vouchsafed unto us. We promise to renew our unfeigned thanks at thy divine altar, and amend our lives according to thy holy word. And now, Almighty God, as thou hast given us grace at this time to make our common supplications unto thee, and hast promised that to those who ask in thy Son, our Saviour's name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill, O Lord, we beseech thee, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be expedient for them granting us in this world a knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting through the merits of our blessed Mediator and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father, receive us this night into thy almighty protection. Bly's journey of 3,618 nautical miles, or 6,701 kilometres, took him 47 days and was acknowledged as the longest and most arduous open boat journey in naval history. His voyage required skill, courage and daring. It was done through mostly uncharted and rough waters in which every quality that he possessed was put to the test. Bly's remarks in his journal, which in this time hides nothing, reveals a man not so self-confident as we usually see. 
He writes, If ever men experience the power of goodness of divine providence, we do it this instant in a most eminent degree. And I presume to say our present situation would make the boldest seaman tremble that ever lived, as the least error in the helm would in a moment be our destruction. Captain Cook, years before, had sailed his ship on the reefs on the northeastern tip of Australia and had named the place Providential Channel after his ship had been spared. On this open boat voyage, Bly acknowledged God's sovereignty for God's provision in the same place. Bly stated, Providential Channel, I imagine, must lie very nearly under the same meridian with our passage. We now return God thanks for his gracious protection, and with much content took our miserable allowance of a twenty-fifth of a pound of bread and a quarter of a pint of water for dinner. Bly gave thanks that Providence supplied food on many occasions, mainly birds that flew onto the boat while on their journey in the vastness of the open sea. When they arrived at Restoration Island, Bly sat under a tree all of the last day there, correcting his prayer book. It is noted that he would say a new prayer each morning and night. Bly also mentioned of his journey, I reflect how providentially our lives were saved at Tafoa Island Tonga by the Indians delaying their attack, and that, with scarce anything to support life, we crossed a sea of more than 1,200 leagues without shelter from the inclemency of the weather. When I reflect that in an open boat, with so much stormy weather, we escaped foundering, that not any of us were taken off by disease. Thus, through the assistance of divine providence, we surmounted the difficulties and distresses of a most perilous voyage, and arrived safe in a hospitable port. Bly eventually returned to England and his career in the Navy continued, seemingly unaffected by the mutiny. In 1790 he became captain of the sloop HMS Falcon, followed by service on other vessels. In 1792 he again visited Tahiti and successfully transported breadfruit to the West Indies. Following the Battle of Copenhagen in 1801, he was commended for his bravery by Admiral Nelson and elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in consideration of his distinguished services in navigation and botany. While it is told that Bly was a hard man, his logbook actually shows that he was in fact lenient. He scolded when other captains would have whipped and whipped when other captains would have hanged. Later, Bly would serve as the Governor of New South Wales and was sent to sort out the issue of corruption and the illegal trade of rum in the colony. Government officers and military associates were defying government regulations by engaging in private trade for personal profits. Behind me is Bly Point on Bruny Island. Now, that's significant because William Bly anchored off here in 1809, and that was because in 1808, on the 26th of January, there was a rum rebellion, they call it, and that rebellion that took place in New South Wales when Bly was governor was led by John MacArthur and others such as Major George Johnson, who later had to uh, give reasons for their mutiny or rebellion and in England. And so Bly stayed off here hoping for news and keeping an eye on ships that entered the Derwent River just up here so that he could be reinstated. Unfortunately, that didn't happen for him, and so he went back to New South Wales after Governor Macquarie was installed and sailed to England in 1810. After 1810, Bly was promoted to Rear Admiral of the Vessel Blue, and in 1814 became a Vice Admiral. He died three years later in London in 1817 and was buried in a family plot with monument atop with sculpted breadfruit. The house that he lived in also stands till this day. Bly's journey had many ups and downs, a mutiny and betrayal by his friend Fletcher Christian, an incredible journey of thousands of kilometres in an open boat, and being deposed as governor with the Rum Rebellion for simply doing his job. We find in William Bly a man who through these challenges had a faith not commonly known nor necessarily taught today. He realised his own limitations and inability to change circumstances on his own. He acknowledged his need for dependence on God and despite his faults exhibited his relationship with Jesus Christ for us to be encouraged and learn about today.